Okay, pop quiz time. Do you need ESD protection? Are you designing something that might include shoes on carpet? Are you designing something with USB Type-C or another fine pitch connector? Are you working on an automotive design? Or maybe you're working on an industrial design? Yes, you see what I'm saying. But what kind of options do you have for ESD protection for your next design? Well, I'm glad you're here. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. I have an expert in the field of ESD protection. Hanson Tong from Toshiba is joining me today to take the mystery out of ESD protection once and for all. Why do you need it? How does it work? And what kind of results should I expect? Well, everyone, let's get started. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about ESD protection solutions from Toshiba. Hi, Hansen. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. I'm happy to be with you today. Thank you for this opportunity. So in my designs, it seems like we always forget about ESD protection until the last minute. But it's really important, isn't it? So what kinds of applications are you seeing ESD being important in these days? Yeah, ESD protection is usually the last thing on the mind of a designer. You have a lot of things to worry about with regards to power, whether you know, the circuits are designed properly and how you could test it. But ESD is something that's typically optional. It's not in a marketing spec typically, but you could find it in a lot of mobile devices, especially consumer devices such as smartphones, tablets notebook computers, monitors, and also things which you would think should have ESD protection, such as wristband trackers, which are constantly in contact with your hand. And you would find a high chance of having ESDs come true, the device. But yeah, it's typically not on the forefront of what you would think. Consumers walking around with shoes on carpet and shuffling and touching all of these devices on the wall? Exactly. So with high-speed serial interfaces getting so much faster in these types of designs we've talked about, we run into problems with some of the traditional ESD protection solutions, right? Yes. So high-speed interfaces are pretty common nowadays. You've seen USB increase from uh, USB 2.0, which was in the 480 megabits range. Now you're looking at USB 3.0. They've just released a new spec recently for much faster speeds from 5 gigs to 10 gigs and now 20 gigs as well. And one of the key things about user interfaces is that you have ports that's external facing, but that's not the only reason why you want to use ESD protection diodes. But that's one of the key reasons because that's a recipe for disaster because it's exposed to the external world that we live in. So some of the other challenges that we might see other than the interfaces getting faster and faster include things like connectors becoming smaller and smaller. So you have the USB Type-C connector, which is a really small connector with a lot of different pins built into it. Another key challenge that you might see nowadays is as ASICs and system level designs becoming more and more compact, the process nodes going down below 20 nanometers, they become more and more prone to ESDs. So it becomes more and more important now than ever to have ESD protection built into some of these new devices that we are designing. Cool. So how do we deal with all those new issues that keep cropping up? A good place to start would be for high-speed interfaces. If you look at high-speed interfaces, you want to put an ESC protection diode in there. You would typically want to put it shunted to ground. And when that happens, you introduce problems such as what we call insertion loss. So insertion loss is predominantly driven by how much capacitance you introduce to the line. And this could be traces, but one of the key things is that you're essentially adding a capacitor to the line by adding an ESD protection diode shunted to the ground. And in that situation, when you move from 5 gigabits, for example, to 10 gigabits per second, you would also have to reduce the capacitance that you load onto the line by half. So that's kind of where the challenge comes in for high-speed interfaces especially. So we need ESD protection with lower capacitance than we've had before. Exactly. So if less capacitance is better, I can totally see that. But what are the challenges we face when we get to those lower capacitances? 
typically when you go with low capacitance, there are certain ways that you could go about doing it. For ESD protection diodes, essentially it's an array built into the process itself of different diodes stacked in series and in parallel to bring the capacitance down. And by stacking a lot of these diodes in series, you could actually end up increasing the resistance of the product. And this resistance is what we call dynamic resistance. And that could be a key concern. If you look at certain cells within the ESD protection diodes, you would notice that there could be an increase in series resistance in the cell itself. Another way you could bring down the capacitance is by stacking two ESD diodes back to back in a package. And that could work by bringing down the capacitance by halving the S capacitance. But same way, because you have two chips in series, it increases the resistance by twofold. So what happens is now you end up with a trade-off between capacitance and dynamic resistance, which ultimately contributes to the clamping voltage. So dynamic resistance goes up, the clamping voltage goes up as well. So by reducing the capacitance by half, you have actually essentially increased the compensated by increasing the resistance and the clamping voltage of the ESD protection diode. And this compromises how well the ESD protection diode can effectively protect the system it's supposed to protect. But what Toshiba and a lot of the industry folks are doing is how do we actually try to improve this trade-off line such that even though you reduce the capacitance, the trade-off is not as bad as it should be. And that's where we would like to introduce our new technology, which we call snapback characteristics, which actually helps improve that. So how do we improve this trade-off line? So snapback characteristics, essentially, if you look at the IV curve of a ESD protection diode, it implements some sort of a thyristor type topology. And by doing that, it actually switches back at high current. So ESD is essentially a high current pulse that comes in. And you want to pass the small signals that comes in from these high-speed interfaces. But at the same time, you don't want the ESD to go true. So low current, you want to pass true. High current, you want to filter, essentially. So what this essentially does is that it allows the low current small signals to go through effectively, at the same time blocking and syncing the high current ESD pulses. And the snapback characteristics actually help that. So we want to know which pulses are our friends and which are our enemies? Exactly. You want to keep the good ones and throw out the bad ones. Okay, so let's dive into some details and talk about Toshiba's ESD protection specifically. So in terms of processes, there are a couple of ways that we could go about doing it. And early on, we looked at a trade-off line. We could actually improve the trade-off by implementing technologies such as snapback. Now, how do we productize a lot of these processes depends on what the market is looking for. And there are four ways that we productize some of our new products that are coming out. The first one is, first of all, to also look at some of the other conditions other than dynamic resistance and clamping voltage that's important in improving the capability and the efficiency of the ESD diodes in syncing the ESD strikes. And we call that V-peak, low V-peak, and high fast turn-on time type products. So that's the first step that we are looking into going forward. We have a couple of other things that we look at in our roadmap. And as I mentioned early on, capacitance is a key issue if you want to have higher and higher speed products. So that's also another way that we go about working on the roadmap and also some high voltage development and some low voltage development to supplement some of the other lineups. All right, let's dive into the deep end a little bit and talk about that first one. What about low V-peak and fast turn-on versions? ESD pulses are short 1 nanosecond pulses that jump quickly to 16 amps. It could be even higher than that, depending on the situation. And the ESD protection diode, if it's good and is effective, it will keep this clamping voltage as low as possible. So that would be the first pulse that typically we see damaging the SOC or the systems that it's trying to protect. The second thing is how quickly you could turn on the uh, ESD protection diode. As we all know, it's a passive device. So you just put it there and it syncs the, the current pulse that's coming in. So the quicker it is, it can react. As we know, it's a one nanosecond pulse. It's a really, really quick pulse. The better it can actually sync the ESD pulse that's coming in. So those two things are what we focus on. 
So they all know how fast it can deal with this really fast rise time. Exactly. An example of how we perform compared with some of our competitors is we can actually reduce these peak voltages by up to 20%. And that could actually be the threshold between the system surviving the ESD strike or not. So that's one of the key things that we look into. The second thing that we do look into is how quickly it can turn on. So we define it by the graph that you see over here. And in that sense, we do turn on much quicker as well. So if you look at another comparison chart between us and our competitors, 0.75 nanoseconds turn on compared to the quickest competitor we have tested, which is at 0.95 nanoseconds. So what are all of these devices in this family that we're talking about? We do have two different flavors. Some of them are bidirectional, some of them are unidirectional. And we offer them in two different voltages, one for 3.3 volt lines and one for 5 volt lines. And the ones that we show here on this table is for the small 0201 single packages, which we think are uh, most pertinent for in your designing ESDs in the last minute. But we also do offer some of these in 4-bit arrays and 2-bit arrays as well. Last minute sounds like a lot of teams I know. Yeah, that's what most engineers are in trouble with. So what if I have really fast signals in my design and I need to get even less than that 0.3 picofarad we're talking about? Well, that's a very good question. If you look at the user interface roadmaps, for example, USB 3.2, moving from Gen 1 to Gen 2, they're moving from 5 gigabits to 10 gigabits per second. Of course, any good signal integrity engineer would tell you that we want to keep the capacitance as low as possible, but sometimes they don't really have a choice on what they have in the market. So they end up using maybe a 0.3 or 0.4 picofarad type ESC protection diode, even for 10 gigabits per second line. But we do recommend going below 0.2 picofarads. So we do have some ESC protection diodes in our roadmap that offers 0.15 picofarads capacitance. So what kind of performance are you seeing with the 0.15 picofarad devices? So for the 0.15 picofarad devices, we are looking at using these for 10 gigabits per second and 10 gigahertz and 20 gigahertz type applications. Over here, even though we want to keep the capacitance as low as possible, some of the preliminary devices that we have looked at, the DF2B6M4ASL, for example, the red dotted line, we've make sure that we can reduce the capacitance low enough and yet not compromise on the clamping characteristics. So it's a good balance between low capacitance that can handle 10 gigahertz and 20 gigahertz type applications, but also at the same time have good clamping characteristics. So get the best of both worlds. Let's shift gears a little bit. Okay, so in USB type C cables, we have power lines running right next to high speed signal lines. And that seems to cause a lot of problems. That's correct. So for USB type C connectors, you have the VBUS lines running right by the high speed data lines. There could be potential that the voltage would jump if you're looking at using USB power delivery, for example, which goes up to uh, 9 volts, 15 volts, 20 volts even, you could potentially see some of these high voltage lines ending up on the high speed data lines. So some of those ESD protection diodes I had mentioned earlier on, they are suitable for 3.3 volts and 5 volt lines. But what happens if a 20 volt voltage appears on that high speed data line? And that's kind of the idea behind these high voltage, high speed ESC protection diodes that we're going to introduce. Okay, and also, it seems like every year my signal voltages seem to get lower and lower. How do we continue to get ESD protection as our interface voltages drop? If you're looking at 3.3 volts and 5 volts and then going higher voltages because of the USB-C type applications, the other perspective is what happens if you do have lower voltages such as 1.8 volt I.O or 1.2 volt IOs for some of these newer ASICs. Or perhaps, for example, SD cards that runs at 1.8 volts today and could potentially go lower than that as well. You want to keep the breakdown voltage as close as possible. So what happens is then the clamping voltage also becomes lower and lower. So that also improves the protection that you provide to the system by keeping the clamping voltage as close as possible to the voltage of the data line. So we do have some plans for new products that will operate below 5 volts. It sounds like a lot of new things are coming. So what does your product roadmap look like for ESD? So 
We've talked throughout this presentation on low capacitance processes, but we do have new other processes such as if you don't need 0.3 picofarads or one picofarad to two picofarads is good enough for you. Why would you do that? Obviously, is the clamping voltage will be better, dynamic resistance will be better, and there'll be better performance as well. Uh, so we do have some processes there that uh, caters to these applications. And we also have TVS processes which cater to power lines. So if you want to protect against a lightning strike, or you want to protect against something which is much higher current than the ESD strikes that we talked about today. And that would be also a different set of processes that we do have. So in terms of products, the low capacitance products are what you see in the chart over here in the roadmap. Low capacitance is one of the key things that we talked about today. The low clamping voltages for low voltage processes, high voltage processes, and I mean products that are there. But also, say, if you want to protect the battery lines or you want to protect fingerprint sensors, audio lines or display lines, we do have a wide range of different ESC protection diodes you can pick from. Okay, great. I am ready to get started. And that means I'm going to have to think about ESD earlier in my design cycle from now on. Now, what resources do you have available for me to learn about ESD protection? We have a great website that you can find a lot of resources. We group them based on uh, the type of capacitance that you would like to see. We have some app notes that's available online with white papers and also design tools such as S21 parameters, simulations that you could actually download. So do check out our website. And of course, we'd be more happy to provide samples. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Hansen. Thank you for this opportunity. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about ESD protection for high-speed data line interfaces from Toshiba. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talk section of EE Journal. Can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal.